Good evening, everyone. Good to see you all. It's a wonderful Friday evening here. Um, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you, wherever you are. Um, yeah, I see we've got horse, of course, and we've got Artsy Fartsy. Great to have you guys in the chat. I hope you can all hear me just fine. Uh, do let me know with the one that my audio is coming through all right and that the signal is stable. So yeah, tonight we are talking about the Quran and we're talking about the preservation and the transmission of the Quran. We're going to have a look at the claim that the Quran was perfectly preserved in its original form from the time of Muhammad. Um, yeah, well, on the face of it, that claim is that claim is completely false. Um, sorry, let me just shut down something here on my computer um because otherwise i'm gonna get these notifications okay that's shut down yep so i was supposed to be live with the thunderous one this evening that was going to be a surprise he was supposed to join me um i think he somehow mistook the time and he is not at home yet he's still on his way home and he's asked me what time will you be streaming <clears throat> so um which is not the question you want to hear when when you're about to start streaming so I, I did push the stream back 30 minutes, but he just contacted me to say, uh, yeah, I'm on my way home. What time do you want to start? So, uh, so yeah, I, I've had to <laughs> just, I, yeah, I need to just get going. So, okay. A couple of things. <laughs> I was, um, Michael Lofton, uh, whose channel I do follow and I watch his content, um, on fire. Welcome. Good to see you. Uh, he had Dr. Javad Hashmi on yesterday. Welcome, Joel Thomas. The whole no change perfectly preserved claim is dubious at best. Yes, it is extremely, not even Muslim scholars believe it. It must, you must be an incredibly uninformed Muslim or a genuinely de deceitful one, or you must be a truly uninformed non-Muslim to even remotely believe that claim. Um, it's, it's <laughs> good grief. We're going to, we're going to take this one apart. And, uh, yeah, last night I was on, um, in the chat in, um, uh, Michael Lofton's uh, Reason and Theology channel, he had Dr. Javad Hashmi on. Dr. Javad Hashmi is um, sort of a, a moderate, modernist Muslim, uh, talking about his views of Islam, which was, um, to put it politely, riddled with errors. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I, 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 I can't say that the man was deliberately deceitful, but I, I would say that um, I, was, I was genuinely underwhelmed at his... Uh, and his knowledge of, of Orthodox Islam. So yeah, it was, it was rather disappointing. And, um, uh, Michael often actually reached out to me during the chat. I sent him an email at his invitation, but he was looking for someone who had a PhD, someone with proper academic con credentials, which I do not have, I guess, since Dr. Javad Hashmi has his PhD and I do not. So apparently I'm not suitably qualified. Although Dr. Hashmi did say that he's not interested in having a debate. Um, I'd be open to just the discussion. Um, also, I was somewhat disappointed that that the um, that they weren't really pushing back against many of the things you were saying, and um, also that um, at one time uh, this wasn't Michael Lofton, but but the other guy, I think Luis or whatever, um, said that he disagreed with the approach of uh, Robert Spencer. No, I, Robert Spencer. I, I know Robert Spencer's work very well. Robert Spencer is correct. So, um, and also there was a Catholic in the channel who was, Lloyd, you were so prejudiced. You're so full of hate. You know, I was posting very, every time Dr. Hashmi said something, I would post very specific citations from the Sharia. He eventually, he basically provided his opinion on Islam, which is fine, which has roughly zero authority. And, um, it's just an opinion. Uh, but this was his view of Islam and, um, he was either in denial or is deeply ignorant or not being truthful about what Islam actually teaches, what its doctrine, what its, what its orthodoxy teaches, what the Sharia teaches. And um, if this is his level of knowledge, then, then we are all in trouble. Um, so, yeah, so make of that what you will, but that was on last night. It was an interesting talk. It might be worth for you to go over there and watch. And uh, as I said, there was a Catholic who was telling me that I'm hateful, that I'm, uh, 
I'm, I'm, I'm not charitable. I'm, I'm not acting out of love because I'm posting all of these, these nasty things from the Muslim sources. And, uh, you know, I really need to be, be loving and kind and, and, and I need to hug a tree and, and just, and just if we hug more trees and kiss more Muslims on the cheek, we'll, we'll have world peace and Hamas will put down their weapons and jihad will end and, and, and prepubescent marital sexual consummation will end right away because 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 tolerance so uh, yeah and uh, the road to hell is paved with good intentions and ignorance is bliss so i guess there's also that school does not mean educated thank you artsy fartsy so yeah i mean my job is to make sure that these nice sweet wonderful kind muslims didn't blow things up like aircraft weapon stockpiles uh, critical national infrastructure like water plants power stations things like you know things like that airports planes with people on them that was my job but okay fine fine i mean it's all nice people and i was yeah i was just being bigoted but but what can i say where does the tree hugging thing come from it's not, no this this is coming from a, a catholic who called me bigoted and hateful and intolerant because i i, I was quoting islamic sharia um so as Dr. Hashmi was saying things, I was quoting these things. And um, I mean, Michael often seemed very doubtful, but then again, few people have my knowledge of Islam. I think it's fair to say, and I don't think I'm exaggerating here, that that I have a very rare knowledge. I have an extremely high level of knowledge of the Sharia, like few people on the planet do, outside of someone who was at Al-Azhar in ISIS, who was trained formally in this stuff. So yeah, but okay, let's, let's dive in. Also, another thing that I, I thought might be interesting is that um, let's dive into this. So I'm thinking of writing a book. So I don't know if you guys would be interested, but I decided my first topic would be this topic on the, so yeah, well, this is just a, just a playful working title, but this is the Quran Kira'at confusion, canonization, confusion and imperfect preservation. Not sure if that'll go down well, but, uh, but I thought it'd be a cool title to start with. So about time, horse, huh? What do you guys think? I mean, I could charge what three hundred, four hundred dollars for my for my first book. Um, you know, I, I give you guys a two dollar discount if you buy it, like five copies. What do you guys think? So anyway, so I thought this was a this was a topic that that is just low hanging fruit. Six hundred and sixty six dollars. Yes. Okay. Fine. Fine. <laughs> do you know who knows more about Islam? Those who have the power to uh, power. Those who have power manipulated to suit them. That's also true. Okay, yeah. So this is my thoughts to write a book on it. Does anyone know whose job was to stop Christian radicals the way people hide stuff Muslim radicals? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Can't read it anymore. It's damn sure we'd purchase. Yeah, I'd make it a PDF. I'm thinking I'd, I'd make an ebook. Um, so this is some of the content because it'll be the similar content to what I have now in the stream that I'm going to do in these talks. However, I will um, have additional detail, much more detail, and links to outside sources. So I'll have screen captures like this. I'll have links to various sites so that you can go directly to these things. It's designed to be a, a reference for polemics or apologetics. It, it's for you to use to inform other people, to um, share with other people, at least hopefully not, not, not buy one copy and then share it to a billion people. Um, but you know, hopefully it'll be priced so that everyone can, can buy a copy, share it with others. And, um, yeah, and then also, so I'll have links to various things, and including yeah, screen caps like these, and even this is even a video by Jay Smith. So I can inside of this, I can insert things like uh, PDFs. Um, I can I can link to other PDFs. I can link to other other websites. I can actually put video inside it. I can put screen caps inside it, things like this. So I can go into much more detail than I will here in this talk. But let us okay. And then final point, as I dive in, I'll probably get banned for offending the feelings of the peaceful community. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great. So if you translate into Portuguese, I can think about it. I want to buy that book. Okay. Yeah. So hopefully it'll be a powerful resource for you guys. Um, now, okay, the other thing is now, guys, we're going to start with what basically I'm going to work within the standard narrative for the first while. So within the standard narrative, there's going to be the wrong terms or incomplete terms or not the exact terms and so on. But that's normal because that's what the common story is. And I will clarify that as we go. And as we go, we will learn about things like the readers, the Qura, the transmitters, the Ruwat. But we're not going to start there. That's that's for like part two. So I hope to do this in three parts. And um, yeah, Maximal, thank you. Yeah, 
the standard narrative. Yeah, so we're going to stick with that, and then we're going to slowly start to diverge from that. And uh, but okay, let us dive right into this topic. It's about time we get started. And uh, Yeshua is Yahweh put me down for five copies of those books. Okay, great stuff. Um, you're welcome. So. Quran, Kira'at, canonization, and imperfect provisation. Now, the Quran is supposed to be an illumination. I think it's just gaslighting. So, on fire for Jesus, I heard a Muslim say that their good needs must outweigh their sins to get to heaven, but they also said they can't have sin on Judgment Day. So, yeah. Uh, the thing is that there is no salvation within Islam um, because there's no certainty from Allah. The only way to guarantee yourself certainty is to kill or be killed in jihad for the sake of Allah, in the path of Allah. That's, it's that simple. Okay, let's talk about this topic. The claim made by Islam about the Quran. So Muslims claim that the Quran was written by Allah in heaven, in paradise, and sent down to Muhammad, and that it has been perfectly preserved with no alterations. Welcome, Thunderous. Good to see you. Pity about the timing. I, I even delayed half an hour just to be on the safe side, but uh, yeah. Now, Muslims claim that the Quran was revealed to Prophet Muhammad over a period of 23 years and that it was neither altered nor corrupted since its first revelation 1400 years ago. Now, Muslims believe that the Quran has been perfectly preserved in its original form. We've all been told this. Now, recently on my channel, as I published three short videos, two to three minutes long, uh, on this topic, on the on the Birmingham Quran, because Muslims keep going on about, well, the oldest Quran, the early, we have an early Quran, it's the Birmingham Quran, yeah, it's two pages, two whole pages. Amazing. Out of a book with, I don't know, 100, 200, 300 pages, you've got two whole pages. That's that's not a Quran, that's, that's uh, and also it doesn't exactly contain strictly Quranic material. It's written in a style that is definitely not early. Uh, we'll get into all of that, but also it, it contains apocrypha, it contains Christian myths and apocrypha. So is it a Christian storybook that was just written in an Arabic style like the Quran or is it a Quran? One of those questions. So anyway, but, and then I had Muslims say, who says that we claim that the Quran is preserved in its original form? Nobody says that. I'm like, did I eat crazy pills? Wow, thank you very much. New coffee shop sale. Thank you very much for the support on coffee. Thank you very much. Oscolas, thank you very much. So yeah, exactly. They claim that the Quran is preserved word for word, letter for letter, dot for dot. And someone said, no, no one says that. Who says that? No, no Muslim makes that claim. I was like, did I just eat crazy pills? Because I'm pretty sure I've seen that before. So moving on. So the Quran was preserved perfectly in its original form since it was first collected into a single volume by Muhammad. Muslims also point to verses in the Quran that state that no one can change the words of Allah and that Allah preserves and protects his words. Now, the Bible does not make a similar claim. The Bible is a collection of religious texts that were written by multiple authors over a span of many centuries. Yeshua is Yahweh says the seven sleepers was well known before Islam was a twinkle, precisely, and that is the that is one of the stories, one of the few stories that is within this Birmingham Quran. It's really the Birmingham fragment. So now, the Bible includes various genres. We have historical accounts. It is description, not prescription, whereas the Quran is prescription, right? It contains poetry. The Bible contains letters and prophetic writings. The Bible does not present itself as a single book written by God and then sent down from heaven. Now, certainly I've had quote unquote Christians tell me that it was, that it's preserved in heaven and was sent down by God. And I was like, you're Christian, but that's, yeah. Mohijab and Kadi say that. Yeah, I have the videos. Yeah, of course, they, they all make these claims. Now, scholars have examined ancient manuscripts, of course, and translations to understand the accuracy and reliability of the biblical text. Now, it is recognized that there have been variations and textual differences amongst the manuscripts of the Bible because copying will create that. That's that's a well-known uh, well phenomenon. Right. However, scholars have also developed methods to reconstruct the original texts and determine the most reliable readings. That sounds like a Mormon belief of the Bible. Yes, yes. Now, Sunan Ibn Majah, 1944. Right. It was narrated that Aisha said, the verse of stoning and of breastfeeding an adult ten times was revealed and the paper was with me under my pillow. When the messenger of Allah died, we were preoccupied with his death and a tame sheep came in and ate it. So yeah, so Quran 
is preserved perfectly from the beginning, except for this verse at least that's missing. And uh, a sheep ate it because Allah did not protect it, although Allah protects the Quran and it's perfectly preserved. Now this is classed Sahih by Ibn Hazm and apparently Hassan by Al-Albani. So this is, when you go to most sites like Sunnah.com, this is Hassan. So, but now my, my aim for the initial part of this talk, maybe part three, I will talk about the Hadith evidence. But the aim is not to go through the Hadith here. It's, I'll just lightly be touching on that. I want to go through a different set of histories. Right, now, now why are there multiple canonical readings? If the Quran was always perfectly preserved, why was a new Quran version canonized in 1985? Why did Saudi Arabia publish a new Quran in 1985? And then why was there a Quran version canonized in 1924? So if the Quran is perfectly preserved, unchanged, letter for letter, dot for dot, word for word, comma for comma, why did the Egyptians have to make a new Quran to correct errors in the other Qurans in 24 and then again in 26 make an edit to it, in 36 make an edit to it, and then again the Saudis made a new Quran in 1984, 1985. The Quran was supposedly compiled during the time of the Prophet Muhammad and the rightly, oh sorry, oh, sorry, sorry about that. The Quran was supposedly compiled during the time of the Prophet Muhammad and the wrongly guided caliphs, right? The Rashi wrong caliphs in the 7th century AD. Um, yes, thunderous, canonized by Uthman, yeah, we all thought so. Now, why have there been multiple efforts over the centuries to establish authoritative readings and versions of the text? Because this implies numerous unauthorized versions of the text. It implies numerous variants of the text, right? Now, which this is odd because the Quran's been perfectly preserved, we are told. Now, my aim is, of course, as you know, not to rehash the standard thing from David Wood or whomever else. I'm not, I am not here trying to, to just run through the standard apologetics or polemics, right? So, Muhammad received the Quran as written by Allah on the tablets in paradise, transmitted by the angel gibberish, uh, thanks to Thunderous for that, copied by his scribes, and literally nothing has changed. Not a word, not a comma, not a dot. Yet, there are still, today, multiple canonical readings. So, despite its perfect preservation, the Qur'an has been transmitted through multiple canonical readings or kira'at that were accepted by early Islamic scholars. Even the early Islamic scholars admitted multiple variants. And Muslims today. So, let's have a look at these variant Qur'ans that are all identical, except that they're different. Because not a letter, not a comma, not a dot has changed. So, standardizing the standardized Qur'an. So, after the Prophet Muhammad's death, Many Hufaz, those who had memorized the Qur'an, a Hafiz, were killed in battles, right? This loss led to a shortage of individuals who could recite the Qur'an from memory. See the Battle of Yamama, right? The one and only Qur'an is perfectly preserved, all 30 of them. Exactly. Thank you, Mr. Rock. Now, a Hafiz, right? Adjective, a designation for one who knows the Qur'an by heart. That's Encyclopedia of Islam. Links in the description. Get hold of a copy. This is always volume 13 that I referenced, which is the index volume. And then, of course, you can go to volume 8, page 171a, left-hand side column. A great traditionist, okay? And additional additional references. So, the fact of these, these Hafiz, or Hufaz, dying, this prompted the first caliph, Abu Bakr, to order the collection and compilation of the Quran into a single manuscript under the supervision of Zaid ibn Tabit, right? He's a respected Hafiz himself. His task was to collect all written fragments of the Quran, including those on papyrus, on stone, on camel bones, and palm leaves, into one unified copy. Uh, Tony asks, why did the Hafiz even have to go into battle in the first place? Imagine if the scribes of the Bible or the reciters of the Vedas went fighting. Isn't that an odd question? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a very good question, Tony. Uh, fair question. Okay. So... <clears throat> Now, <clears throat> sorry. So I'm going to, as I said, I'm going to present sort of the standard narrative, and then we're going to we're going to, we're going to introduce things that um, you know take us away from the standard narrative. We're going to throw in a few. We're going to throw a few wrenches into the works, right? So to ensure accuracy, Abu Bakr apparently set the criteria that every verse of the Quran must be memorized by at least two hufaz. Now I could not find a reference for this claim. I am still trying to find. Where did Abu Bakr set a criteria that every verse must be memorized by at least two Hufas? Um, if someone can help me, I'd actually like to find it. I did try to find it. Look, I didn't spend the whole day on it, I will admit. But 
But now I'm presenting a narrative as I've known it, as you find it on the internet, et cetera, et cetera, or in the comments section, right? So, so if someone can find me where this criteria is in the chat or in the comments later, I would love to know. Now, this was the first standardization of the Quran. So it did not happen during Muhammad's lifetime, although Muslims will tell you it was standardized during the life of Muhammad, but this is after the death of Muhammad, right? Later, during the Caliphate of Uthman, variations emerged in recitations of the Quran. Uthman then, in, or then ordered the preparation of a standardized codex based on Abu Bakr's compilation, and he had all the other codices destroyed. He had them burned. It was the companions of the Prophet Muhammad, right, starting with Abu Bakr and then Uthman, in the Sin, at least, in the standard Islamic narrative, who took the initiative to compile the scattered verses into complete written manuscripts, not Muhammad. That's a claim I've seen Muslims make over and over. Muhammad did it. No. If it's written on camel bone, palm leaves, papyrus, and stones, it's probably not, <clears throat> not, you know, yeah, it's, it's definitely not canonized properly. <clears throat> so the Islamic belief is that the Quran was revealed to Muhammad over 23 years, but was preserved in its original form through this compilation process after his death. So it was perfectly preserved while he was alive, and then it was perfectly preserved and compiled after he's dead because it was done while he was alive. Now, Bukhari. Let's talk about authentic hadith evidence. See Sahih Bukhari, right? 7191, judgments, ahkam, sunnah.com, sayings and teachings of the Prophet Muhammad. Abu Bakr said to me, Umar has come to me and said, a great number of qadis of the Holy Quran were killed. Quras, this will be Quras, right? Qura, well, that's, yeah. Were killed on the day of the battle of our Yamama. And I'm afraid that the casualties among the Qadis of the Qur'an may increase on other battlefields, whereby a large part of the Qur'an may be lost. So they were genuinely concerned they would lose the Qur'an, which Allah was not preserving very well. Zaid further said, By Allah, if Abu Bakr had ordered me to shift a mountain among the mountains from one place to another, it would not have been heavier for me than this ordering me to collect the Qur'an. And then I said to Umar and Abu Bakr, How can you do something which Allah's messenger did not do? do in other words why would you want to do this muhammad didn't order a single quran why would you want to do this so i started compiling the quran by collecting it from the leafless stalks of the date palm tree and from the pieces of leather and hides and from the stones and from the chests of men who had memorized the quran right so this is on so you have a reference here it is on sunnah.com sahih bukhari judgments right hadith 7191 it is desirable that the scribe should be honest and wise. This authentic narration obviously disproves the claim that the Quran was completed and compiled when Muhammad was alive, which is a common yet false Muslim assertion. Now, um, how can they call the revelation from how can they call this revelation from Allah when Uthman and Abu Bakr were the ones to compile the manuscript? Correct, and they have the audacity to claim the Tanakh and the New Testament to be corrupted, and that's a very fair. Question. Thank you very much. I have no idea how to pronounce your name. So, uh, but yes, this was not something compiled by Muhammad. How do you know they didn't compile it and make changes to suit themselves? We already know the Quran was burned, was collected and burned, right? And Yeshua Yahweh says, how many people memorized the Quran at the time of Mo's death? Only four. Yeah. Right. Let's continue. So now let's have a look at this. Transmitters. These are transmitters of the Quran, right? We'll detail, we'll get into all the details and terms a little bit later. You have Kalun, 835, Warsh, 812 AD. These are their, their, their death dates. Al-Bazi, okay? Kunbu, Al-Duri, Al-Susi, Hisham, Ibn Daqwan, Shuba, Hafs, also called Hafs and Hivs, right? You have Hafs, Hifs, Hafs, whatever. Khalaf, Khalad, Alayt. Ruwais, Isn Isa ibn Wardan, Ibn Jumaz, Rauch, Ishaq, Idris. Now, these are the different transmitters of the Quran. Jeremy H, I've already covered the goat. So, yeah, we have no remains of palm leaves and bones with verses of the Quran, no stones either. Yeah, now, all of these are differing variants of the Quran. They're differing in phrasing, in pronunciation, and orthography. Yet, they are all considered authentic transmission of the Qur'an. Now, what are orthographic differences? Let's look at some examples. So, a difference in orthographic orth well, orthography refers to a variation in spelling or punctuation or use of letters and diacritics in writing systems or languages. 
This can include differences in the conventions of how words are written, pronounced, and presented, and can occur between different dialects, regions, or historical periods. For example, UK English and American English have differences in orthography, right? such as the spelling of certain words, like the word color in British versus color in American, or tap versus faucet, right? Um, yeah, elevator versus lift. It's like, okay, you guys have to be technical. Now, there are many differences in orthography found, orthography found in early readings and manuscripts of the Quran reflecting variant orthographic practices. So here are three specific examples. The writing of the Hamza. I don't speak Arabic, so hey, don't even bother to ask me here. But these are examples that I'm using that are supposedly quite valid. Some early manuscripts write the Hamza in words like this, like Ras, head, and you see, and with an Aleph, while others write it with just the Hamza alone. Okay, I'm sure there's a video on YouTube that will explain all of that, right? Now you have the writing of long vowels. Early manuscripts show variations in how long vowels were represented orthographically. For example, this word here, Kalu, they said is sometimes written with just an Aleph, omitting the wow to represent the long U vowel, right? And you have joined versus separated writing. So these are differences in writing style, differences how words are spelled, and there are also these Examples when some early manuscripts join words that other manuscripts separated, like writing Ladina as one word versus separating it into two words, Li Aladina. So you've got this version versus that version, right? So these are differences in terms of how the Quran in orthography. So these variations do show the developing nature of Arabic orthographic conventions. There was no single consistent writing style. In the earliest centuries of Islam, before the standard Uthmanic orthography became widely adopted. If you see numbers like this, and usually I delete them, these are references to links. Okay. Now, wrong Qurans, the Cairo edition, 1924. So in 1924, um, a committee of scholars based in Cairo, Egypt, published an edition of the Quran known as the Cairo edition. Now, I've seen this reference, Al Musaf Al Musawar. I could not find exactly where this came from. But it's also known as the Royal or Alamiri Musaf. So this that's a minor issue there. But if someone can find that, let me know. It is the first printed Quran to be accepted by Muslim authority. Wait, wait, hold up, hold up. The 1924 Cairo edition of the Quran is the first printed Quran to be accepted by a Muslim authority. No Muslim authority had accepted a Quran until 1924. Okay, that's odd. So this authority was Al-Azhar University in Egypt. The process of creating what was called also the Fu'ad Quran, right, from the King Fu'ad of Egypt, lasted 17 years. Uh, Al-Azhar was the authority. So they took from 1917 to 1924 to compile a Quran that had authority based on a document that had never changed and was preserved dot for dot, letter for letter, unchanged in a singular form since the time that Muhammad was given it by Allah through Jibril, who wrote it down with his scribes. And it's never changed since then, but it took them 17 years to figure out what the right, what the right Quran was because the, the Quran they have, all the Qurans are unchanged dot for dot, letter for Does that sound like a lot of nonsense? That is clearly... A contradiction this is clearly this shows this is a myth someone is not being honest with somebody right so they achieved this with the support of king fuad the first of egypt and the supervision of of azari scholars right and yet they chose to preserve one of 14 kira art readings jeremy um can we do this chronologically because you know it's like one two three four five six and you're going to be going what about 943 and three quarters i want to talk about i'm i'm getting there if you'll just be patient i will get there okay so for some reason al azhar chose to preserve one of the 14 kira art readings i just showed you this example of this list of variant Qurans, right? We just went through a brief list. We'll come back to the list a few times. So they chose to preserve one of them. Why that one? Why that particular one? It's not even the earliest one, right? It's, it's not even, in fact, it's not even from an original source, right? It's from a secondary source, right? So 
Al-Azhar started the project in 1907. It took them 17 years to standardize an unchanged text that was perfectly preserved since Muhammad's day. That makes no sense, right? Now, this, now, Ruwaya, right, means, so, sorry, let me just finish this. The, this edition aimed to establish a standardized written text and was based primarily on the canonical reading of Havs and Asim, who died in 796. Notice, not 632, not 633, not 630. 35, right after Muhammad, not 638, around the time of, you know, Uthman and Omar and Caliph Abu Bakr and all that stuff. No, 796. This is, subtract that from 632, that that is 100 and what, 64 years after Muhammad died, right? And it was published in 1924 by a committee of scholars based in Cairo, Egypt. It's also termed the Rawaya or oral transmission of Hafs. So, Ruwaya, in literature, the oral transmission of a tradition, of a poem or a story. Also, the authorized transmission of books. And in modern Arabic, it means a story, a novel, a play, or a film. Notice how the term Ruwaya refers to fiction. Now, amendments were made in 1924 to the Quran. And then again, this Quran was updated in 1936. Now, this Quran has had a very significant impact on the Arabic-speaking Muslim world and is considered a milestone in the history of the Quran's textual standardization. They, they, it was a milestone, it was a major achievement. So, hold on. They had to standardize something that was standardized during the lifetime of Muhammad 1,400 years ago. It, it was an achievement to standardize what had never changed. It's like, it's like, hey, we've just invented a round wheel, guys. We, we've, it's... 2024 we've just invented a round wheel get get wow we've just invented a thing called pizza you know and it, it's incredible we've standardized the wheel we've made it round it's like it's like you mean it wasn't round before that apparently not not in this case now this is all very weird since the Quran was standardized and preserved in the first century of Islam now al-Azhar is highly important to Islam right they're considered highly important and highly respected in the Islamic world for numerous reasons it is the oldest and most prestigious Islamic university in the world. Founded in 970 to 972 in Cairo, Egypt, it has a long history and tradition, and it has immense credibility and authority on Islamic teachings and scholarship. As someone mentioned, they put their stamp of approval on the reliance of the traveler. Right? Yeah, so Tony, the standardization of the standardization of the standardization. Correct. Right? Al-Azhar has played a central role in the study and preservation of the Quran and Islamic scientists for over a millennium, right? Over a thousand years. Its scholars were instrumental in establishing methodologies for Quranic recitation, kira'at, memorization, and interpretation. I thought this was all fixed up in the first century of Islam, but apparently not. Um, Artsy says, so they're gaslighting everyone, like acting like everyone had a symptom of the month. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So the 1924 Kairi edition of the Quran, also known as the King Fuad Quran or, or Azhar Quran, was a landmark publication. It was the first printed Quran to be officially accepted and endorsed by Al-Azhar. So there were no official endorsed Qurans. What, what was there before that? Right? And they are a highly influential Muslim authority. So this edition helped standardize helped standardize the written text of the Quran and its ver verse numbering. What? What? They standardized not only the written text but the verse numbering. Okay, the verse numbering. So, okay, so what? There weren't, there wasn't standardized verses on the Quran. The Quran didn't have verses. It, I thought it's unchanged, dot for dot, letter for letter, from the beginning. Why do we have verse numbers now? And it what? Okay, hold on. Right now, Al Asar's acceptance and endorsement of the twenty-four Kari edition lent it immense credibility and legitimacy in the Muslim world. This edition became widely adopted and replicated further solidifying Al-Azhar's status as a preeminent authority on the Quran. So claims by Muslim apologists and their defenders, their cheerleaders, non-Muslim cheerleaders, who want to dismiss or undermine the significance and authority of Al-Azhar are completely unfounded. They lack all credibility. Al-Azhar's long-standing reputation, scholarly contributions, and official endorsement of the 24 Cairo edition have cemented its position as a highly respected institution in the Islamic world. Yeah. Um, Thunderous says, to standardize something, you have to omit something, right? How many total different Qurans were there? Nobody knows. Uh, to be honest, nobody knows. There were dozens, at least. I mean, look, I'm going to show you a list of, no, there's seven. No, no, there's, there's 10. Uh, no, there's 14. Uh, no, no, actually, there's 19. Actually, nobody knows. 
Nobody knows. Okay. Uh, Hatun Tash has shown what? 37 different crowns. <laughs> Trust me, there's more than that. So anyway, let's go on. So, side note, Al-Azhar and Sufism. Al-Azhar was founded in 970 to 972, welcome over, uh, in Cairo, Egypt, by the Fatimid Caliphate as a center for Islamic learning and teaching. This makes it over a millennium old, right? While a few other institutions in like the University of Al-Karawain in Fez, Morocco, founded in 859 AD, are older, Al-Azhar is the oldest that has continually operated as a university-level institution of higher education, right? From its founding, Al-Asad provided advanced instruction in Islamic law, Sharia, very important, theology, Arabic grammar, rhetoric, logic, and other subjects, making it a true university rather than just a mosque school. Right, Al-Asad officially gained university status in 1961 when additional non-religious subjects like medicine and engineering were added to its curriculum. However, it has functioned as a de facto university, university for centuries before that. It is considered one of the most prestigious centers of Arabic literature and Sunni Islamic learning in the world, giving it immense authority and influence. And they also historically had membership from the seven main Sufi orders. In fact, they not only teach the four schools of Sunni fiqh, they teach the seven schools of Sufism as well. The current Sheikh Al-Azhar, right, the rector of the school, Ahmed Al-Tayyib, is a hereditary Sufi Sheikh from Upper Egypt. And the former Grand Mufti of Egypt and senior Al-Azhar scholar Ali Gomar is also a highly respected Sufi master. So this is important because Muslims are going to claim, well, you know, Sufis are not real Muslims. They're, they're actually like Buddhists, you know, from Mars. And, and they're not really Muslims. They don't represent, Islam, yeah, nonsense, whatever. Right? And notice they say here, adherence to a Sufi, and this is written by a Muslim, by the way, Dr. Jonathan Brown. Adherence to a Sufi order has long been standard for both professors and students in the Al-Azhar mosque and university system. Just so, by the way, the Sufis, okay? Uh, everyone's on about the Jesuits. Maybe you need to get on about the Sufis. Maybe it's time you, if you stop stop worrying about the Jesuits for ten minutes. Go have a look at the Sufis. You might you might find something. So Quran desecration hypocrites. So apparently, a large scale destruction of all the Quran manuscripts took place by disposing of them in the Nile River, as part of the effort to standardize and promulgate the twenty four Quran edition. Right as the official text of the Quran in Egypt and much of the Muslim world. Yeah, Jonathan Brown, I know. <laughs> it's like, yeah. So, so, anywho, let's continue. So, this was done following the publication of the influential 1924 Quran, Quran edition of Cairo, which was intended to standardize the text and apparently, and they admit to this, eliminate errors found in previous Quran texts. Hold on. The Quran is perfect. The Quran must be treated with the utmost respect. It is the word of Allah, unchanged, dot for dot, letter for letter. Since the first day that Muhammad got these things, it's perfect, unchanged, completely untampered with, tamper-proof. But there were errors in the Quran, so they had to make a new Quran. It took them 17 years to figure out what the Quran actually said, what the Quran should actually be. 17 years from a book that has never changed. Fascinating. And of course, they then used it in state schools in Egypt. So the 1924 Cairo edition, also known as the Royal or Amariya edition, was published under the patronage of King Fuad. So it wasn't some lame brain that said, hey, let's let's have a great idea. Let's redo the Quran. This was the king of Egypt. So I assume the guy has a clue. It was based on the Hafs and Asim recitation and aimed to preserve aimed to preserve one of the canonical Kira'at or readings of the Quran. Now, now th that 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 <laughs> that statement is not exactly a hundred percent true, but we'll get to all of that. Okay? It's not Yes, but no. Okay, kind of, but maybe not. Yes, but no. Let's just say like that. And also notice, this was not, this this version of the Quran was not based on old Quranic manuscripts. And Muslims say, well, you know, there's loads of old Quran manuscripts. We've got, we've got 53 copies of the original manuscript written by Uthman himself in our, in our, in our shed in the backyard. It's, 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 it's right there. You can see it if you, it's really, it's there. It's true story. So, um, then why didn't Al-Ashar actually utilize one of those old Quran versions that's complete and unchanged? Because they didn't have one. So they had to go to one of the 14 readings. Well, let's 14. Let's just pick a random number. I'll pick 14. I could have said 12, 7, 9, 2, 3, 8, 15, 25. doesn't matter. We'll just pick 14. It's like a nice average. And yeah, they picked one of the one of these readings of the Quran. 
So to establish the standard text, the Egyptian government apparently destroyed pre-924 Quran manuscripts by dumping them in the Nile River. Right? Now, Quran desecration is the treatment of the Quran in a way that might be considered insulting to Muslims. In Islamic law, believers must not damage the Quran, and they must perform a ritual washing before touching it. Conversely, intentionally damaging copies is considered blasphemous in Islam. But apparently it's okay, according to the story, to take thousands of them, stick them on a boat, and throw them in the river. Because it's just paper, right? Apparently it's the word of Allah, perfect, unchanged. Yeah, except those are all full of mistakes. They, uh, they've got errors. Ah, uh, yeah, throw them up. Okay, whatever. So, a desecrated Quran can get you killed. So, according to Islamic historian Michael Cook, the Quran should be wrapped in cloth and buried on holy ground where it is unlikely to be trampled on or safely placed where it is unlikely to come in contact with impurity. Burning, when carried out respectfully, is also considered acceptable. And Saudi Arabia, for instance, destroys Qurans that fall short of state standards by burning to avoid soiling the pages. Intentionally desecrating a copy of the Quran results in imprisonment as punishment in some countries and might result in a death sentence in Afghanistan, Saudi Arabia, Somalia, and Pakistan. Even life imprisonment in Pakistan, according to Article 295B of the Pakistani Penal Code. Bog Katie, you're very welcome. Thank you. It says, thanks, Lloyd. It's good to learn this history. Fascinating information. Thank you. Guys, yes, if you do like this, do smash the like button. Um, you know, make jihad on the like button and tell your friends about it. So, now, for instance, there's the Guantanamo Quran controversy. There's the 2010 Dove World Quran burning controversy. There were the 2012 Bangladesh mob riots. There were the 2012-2015 Afghanistan mob riots. 2013 and 2022 Saudi Arabia sewer Qurans garbage can Qurans, etc. 2017 to 2023, Denmark, Norway, and Sweden riots. And yeah, you can go to this article, which is really good, Quran Desecration on Wikipedia. And let's see, people died during these things because um, th these Danish people didn't treat the Quran respectfully or whatever the case was. People died for this, but, but you can take this perfect Quran, perfect Quran, and throw it in the river and it's just okay. Yeah, wow. Infinite Reach Ministry says, I was not allowed to throw away names of students into the trash because some names were holy, e.g. Muhammad. That is insanity. <laughs> okay, now some further historical context on the Cairo edition. And we'll keep adding a little bit of context and just we'll keep adding some detail. So prior to the 24 edition, there were several slightly varying codices or manuscripts of the Quranic text. The 24 Cairo edition adopted the Hafsan Asim reading which was already the most widespread reading used across the Muslim world. We'll be coming back to all of this to explain why. What is so good about this one? Hafs was already one of the most popular and widely transmitted readings. When they say readings, they mean versions. Especially in the Arab world due to its association with the prestigious scholarly center of Kufa in Iraq. It was already popular and it's associated with Kufa in Iraq. Okay, didn't? Wasn't Muhammad in Mecca and buried in Medina? And Medina is the city of the Prophet and the Quran should come from Mecca or Medina or Mecca because Mecca, a city of Allah, uh, Kufa in Iraq. Okay, fine, fine, if you say so. While widely circulated, the 1924 Cairo text was not universally or officially accepted as the sole authorized version across the Muslim world. Hold on, wait, wait. We just had the first officially canonized Quran since... Uthman's day apparently in 1924 so some some of your grandparents are older than the Quran right and um, it was the first to be endorsed by a major Muslim authority al-Azhar however it was not officially or universally accepted elsewhere in the world uh, so it was official for Egypt official for one suburb in Egypt Official at Al-Azhar, but not outside of the walls of the universe. Okay, fine. Yeah. And other readings and codices continued to be used, studied, and printed in various regions. In the 1730s, Quran translator George Sale noted, 1730s, mind you, George Sale noted seven, seven principal editions of the Quran. He says here, two of which were published and used at Medina, a third at Mecca, a fourth at Kufa, a fifth at Basra, a sixth in Syria, and a seventh called the Common Edition. Okay, let me see. Um, two at Medina and one at Mecca. 
then you had Kufa, Basra, Syria, and a common version. So you had more versions outside of Mecca and Medina than were in Mecca and Medina. He states that the chief disagreement between their several editions of the Quran consists in the division and number of the verses. Oh, they had different verse numbers and they had different amounts of verses in them. I thought this was unchanged, dot for dot, letter for letter from the beginning, but apparently not, not even in the 1700s. Other Muslim countries and communities continued using their traditional codices based on different canonical readings. Although the Hafs reading became increasingly dominant over time due to the influence of the 1924 Cairo edition. So it gained influence due to Egypt's central position in the Arab world and the quality of its printing and distribution. Ah, so there's an edge, the quality of printing and distribution. However, it was not formally approved as a standard text by religious authorities outside of Egypt. Okay, so Al-Azhar is highly influential. However, that influence didn't extend extend to standardizing the Quran outside of Egypt. Now, of course, there will be their followers and their cheerleaders outside who would, but they weren't able to make it universal and dominant. That is fascinating. There were other Qurans, competing Qurans. So the choice of the already widespread Hafs reading for the influential 1924 Cairo, combined with its mass production and distribution, elevated this particular reading to popularity and use across most of the Muslim world in the 20th century not because it was the correct version, or this was the provably earliest version. Wh which version, ask Muslims, I want you to ask Muslims, which version of the Quran is the one that was sent to Muhammad, that was, that was given to him by Jibreel, that, was, that is on the words, word for word, on the tablets, in paradise with Allah? I want to know. Now, how you pronounce the Quran is one issue. You can say, well, you know, these are, these differences are down to pronunciation. Look, man, tomato, tomato, the word is still spelled the same. T-O-M-A-T-O. -O. Uh, yes, it was all of them. So an American says tomato, a Brit says tomato, and someone from someone from Canada goes, uh, what's that word? I, 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 well, what is that? Is that a T? So, yeah, I mean, you, you get these differences, right? But the word is still T-O-M-A-T-O. -O. So this, this is not about spelling. Pronunciation is a completely separate issue to spelling, right? And um, so they can, yeah, so ask them, which was the version, word for word, sent down from Allah to Muhammad, written on the tablets, which was copied, boom, into the books at the time of Uthman? Which copy, which one of these multiple versions is the one in paradise with Allah. I want to know, tell me. They cannot tell you because they no one can tell you. Absolutely nobody. Um, Infinite Reach Ministry says, and that is very, very true. That is so correct. Let me just put that up. He says here, if you have more students studying your version, then your version is the most famous one and it is the correct one. Exactly, it's about influence. Yes, so there you go. So it is simply due to mass production that it became the most popular Quran in the Muslim world in the 20th century. It has since been supplanted but in Egypt, but we'll get to all of that. So there are multiple uncreated tablets in heaven, as in the seven dialects. Yes, peridot, double eight, double seven. That's a very good point. Let me, let me put that up as well. Uh, let me just put that up. Yes, there are multiple uncreated tablets in heaven, as in the seven dialects. Yeah, there are multiple. Allah obviously speaks multiple dialects. So yeah, yeah, that's just how that works. Let's continue. Now, this is the Quran, commonly called the Al-Quran of Muhammad, translated into English from the original Arabic, with explanatory notes taken from the most approved commentators, to which is prefaced a plural, preliminary discourse by George Sale. This is uh, by, uh, this is, it's not written by George Sale, it quotes George Sale, but he writes the introduction. And this is from 1891. London and New York, Frederick Warren and Co., 1891, right, which refers back to George Sale. And he says here, I have never yet seen any manuscript wherein the verses are actually numbered. He writes this. Let me click on this. Let me actually just go there. This is the same thing on Google Books, okay? This is exactly the case here on Google Books. So he says, I have never yet seen any manuscript wherein... <clears throat> um, wherein the verses are actually numbered, though in some copies the number of verses in each chapter is set down after the title, 
which we have therefore added in the table of the chapters. And the Mohammedans seem to have some scruple in making an actual distinction in their copies, because the chief disagreement between their several editions of the Quran consists in division and number of the verses, and for this reason, I have not taken upon me to make any such division. Having mentioned the different editions of the Quran, it may not be amiss here to acquaint the reader that there are seven, seven principal editions, if I may so call them, or ancient copies of that book. Two published and used at Medina, a third at Mecca, a fourth at Kufa, a fifth at Basra, sixth in Syria, and a seventh called the Common or Vulgar Edition, the Vulgate, the Latin Vulgate. Of these editions, the first of Medina makes the whole number of the verses 6,000. I'll just go back to my notes here. So the one in Medina makes the whole number of the verses 6,000. The second and the fifth, 6,214 verses. Are we missing 214 verses somewhere? The third, 6,219. The fourth, 6,236. The sixth has 6,226 verses. And the last has 6,225 verses. Maybe a sheep or a goat ate those. But they're all said to contain the same number of words, namely 77,639, and the same number of letters, 323,015. For the Mohammedans have in this also imitated the Jews, that they have superstitiously numbered the very words and letters of their law. So guys, uh, you can look this up. It is available on Google Books. You can read through this chapter yourself. Uh, the Quran, commonly called the Al-Quran of Muhammad, page 45. And this is the 1891 printing that you see here. Now, hopefully this has taught you something. Hopefully you need to have a discussion with Muslims and go, the Quran was only canonized in 1924. Now, they make all these fancy claims about this, but uh, welcome, Dino Dennis. Now, let's have a look at the Saudi Arabian authorized version of 1985. So the Musaf al Madina and Nabawiya is a printed edition of the Quran that is widely used and distributed from Medina, Saudi Arabia. Are those numbers containing the miraculous number 19? You know what? Let us have a look. Uh, so guys, I'm gonna use I'm gonna just do this in my head because you guys know I've got amazing math skills. So I'm gonna see, I'm gonna use my, my superior knowledge and math skills to do to see if these numbers um divide into 19. And the first one, yes, we have a winner. It divides by 19. That's fantastic. It's a miracle from Allah. Let's have a look at 6,236. Let's divide it by 19. It divides by 19. That's a, it's a miracle. It's another miracle. Let's, let's have a look here. Uh, let's do this number, 6,226 divided by 19. Another miracle. It, it divides by 19. It's incredible. All of these numbers, when you divide by 19, they will divide by 19. It's incredible. It's a miracle. So yeah, guys, there's something something superstitiously crazy going on here that I can't understand. Are you guys ready to say the Shah the Shah Nana? Are you ready to say the Shah Nana? Because um, I think Bowser said it in 1977. Good night, sweetheart. Good night. Okay, so yeah, that that's the Shah Nana. Are you guys ready to say the Shah Nana? So anyway, right. It is an officially printed and published edition of the Quran text by the King Fahd complex for the printing of the Holy Quran in Medina. The text follows, again, the Hafs an Asim Ruwaya, or narration, of the Quranic recitation, which is one of the most widespread readings. Now, I know we're using the word readings here, okay? Uh, I know we're using the word readings, but understand, I said I'm going to kind of present the standard narrative, the standard diction, the standard approach, and then we'll start to we'll start to define these terms more deeply and more more thoroughly more, more academically as we go later it is printed in a large deluxe hardcover format with colored backgrounds and high quality paper different sizes are available like a4 a5 a6 and pocket size the medina mushaf is considered one of the most authentic one of the most not one of the most so of all of these books that are perfectly preserved, not a letter, not a word, not a dot has changed, this one is one of the most authentic. It's very close. It's very, the standard hoax. You know, you just won the internet today. Uh, you just won the internet. Yeah, he says here, uh, <laughs> the standard hoax. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. That, that, that definitely. And Phyllis Alexander, yeah, La Isla Bonita. Uh, but no, it's the Shah Nana, so we have to give respect to Bowser. Okay, so 
The Medina Musaf is one of the most authentic and accurate printed editions of the Quran text, free from errors. It's one of the most authentic. It's not the most authentic, one of the most, okay? It is widely distributed and used by Muslims around the world, especially in Saudi Arabia and Arab regions. Digital versions and apps of this Medina Quran edition are also available for reading on devices, right? Like Kindle. The Musaf al Madina, Madina al Nabawiya, and the Cairo edition, also known as the King Fuad Quran or the Azhar Quran, are two different printed editions of the Quran with differences. Perfectly preserved, letter for letter, dot for dot, authorized versions that are different. Fascinating. So, the Cairo edition, first published in 24 by the Amiri Press in Cairo, Egypt, under the patronage of King Fuad I, the first printed Quran to be accepted by the Al Ashar Authority. The Musaf al Madina al Nabawiya, published by the King Fahd complex, right? It is a more recent edition, first published in 1984. The Cairo edition follows the Hafs and Asim Rawaya, while the Medina is also based on this Hafs Rawaya, but has some differences in formatting and layout. The Cairo edition was influential and popular in the early 20th century, but oh my, oh my, oh, what, what is this? It has been overtaken in popularity in Egypt <clears throat> by the Al Shamarli Mushaf. Oh, that would be the Warsh edition. It's now no longer Hafs, it's Warsh. Fascinating. The Medina Musaf has become the most widely distributed and used around the world, especially in Saudi Arabia and the Arab regions. So now the Saudi Arabians have put their money behind this and they've said, hey, look, we've got to get in on this game. Uh, let's also use the Hafs. Why not? We Because we don't have any early Qurans. If, wh why didn't they just go back to an early first century Quran and print that? Why didn't you just go to the library, pull out one of the old Quran books and go, yeah, we'll just use this. Why did they pick some random reading? Some dude called Hafs. Why, why that? So yeah, that's the, but the Saudis got in on the game, printed their own Quran. So we've already got that. Now the Cairo edition is considered very accurate. It's very, it's really accurate. It's pretty good. It's, it's not bad at all. It's, I, I thought it's perfect, perfectly preserved, dot for dot, letter for letter. It's a very accurate representation of the Uthmanic text with only minor differences in spelling norms compared to early Quranic manuscript. Why not just recite it again? Yes, Yeshua is Yahweh. Why didn't they just recite it again? Why didn't they just go like, uh, yeah, no, I've memorized it. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it to you from Uthman. I, I got it right here in my head. Uh, it's got just minor differences, dot for dot, perfectly preserved, letter for letter. Yeah, someone's not telling the truth here. We really would have to check these early Quran manuscripts to check what, what, what? excuse me? Right? So, now the al Shamarli and the Warsh Kiraat. Now, some places spell it with K, some places spell it with Q. So I will just mix between these just for the sake of showing you that these are the differences. So, is it haram to correct the Quran? Uh, of, of course. Like, well, it had mistakes in it. They had to fix it. They said it's got errors. We got to fix it. Okay, fine. Thought it was fixed in 19... What? In the year one with Muhammad. But okay. Now, the al Shamarli Musaf follows the Rawaya or the narration of Warsh and Nafi. Now, the al Shamarli Musaf became the most widespread Musaf in the Arab lands after the 1924 Cairo edition until the King Fahd Musaf, also called the Medina Musaf, arrived in 1984, 1985. It likely follows a different Rawaya than the Cairo edition, which follows the Hafsan Asim. It does follow, sorry. So the al Shamarli Musaf is popular in Egypt, having overtaken the Cairo edition in usage. Okay, so the Egyptians adopted Hafs, then they've switched to al Shamarli, which is Warsh, and the Saudis got in on Hafs because Hafs was great, and then the Egyptians changed because now the, the Saudis, which is the home of Islam, was beaten to the punch by the Egyptians, so they had to put out their own Quran eventually, and then the Egyptians were like, yeah, we're moving on from here now. Other countries also have their own national printings of the Quran, like, like in Morocco, which uses the Rawaya of Warsh and Nafi. Okay, so in summary, the al Shamarli Musaf, widely used in Egypt, follows Warsh, in contrast to the Hafs and Asim Rawaya in the 24 Cairo and many other Quran printings like the Saudi Arabian one. <clears throat> Now, more on Hafs versus Warsh later. Now, let's look at the Encyclopedia of Islam, Volume 5, page 127. Ada, literally payment or accomplishment. It is the perfect accomplishment. Al-Ada al-Kamil, the perfect accomplishment. Like Muhammad was Insan al-Kamil, right? Muhammad was, uh, as the saying goes, Insan, sorry, Insan al-Kamil, which in English translates to insane as a camel. <clears throat> okay. 
So Muhammad was insan al-kamil, which apparently translates to the perfect man, the perfected man, the completed man, the man who has achieved perfection, right? Now, and these, as opposed to the imperfect, al-ada al-nakis, okay? And in the reading of the Quran, the traditional pronunciation of the letters is the kiraat. Now notice, according to the Encyclopedia of Islam, kiraat is synonymous with ada, right? The two are the same, kiraat, right? And ada, but it's the pronunciation of the letters, but the kiraat, is supposed to be readings. These are different readings, different phraseologies, different orthographies. So which is it? Pronunciations or words? Or is it just anything that, that you need to make up an excuse? Kira'a, kira'at, plural. Reading in the science of the Quran, a recitation, a special reading of a word or singular passage of the Quran, a particular reading or redaction of the entire Quran. So it's a part of the Quran, it's a little bit of the Quran, it's a one word of the Quran, it's the whole Quran, it's the, the cover, the front cover, the back cover, the it's the preface, it's the index, it's the it's the it's a passage, it's a word, it's a special reading, it's a recita it's look, it does everything. Gee whiz, the it's the it's the everything, it's it's marklar. Cause it marklars the marklar when you need to marklar. So if you marklar, you can marklar the marklar with the marklar. Marklar? Marklar. Right? Marklar. So, so yeah, fantastic. It's Kira. Okay, fine. Th thanks, guys. That that really that really solves the problem here. Su super califragilis. Yeah, something like that. Now, at the death of Muhammad, the Quran had not yet been codified. The form of Arabic letters used to note down single parts of it and later the whole collection was very incomplete. So the Quran had not been codified by the time of the death of Muhammad, right? And the form of the Arabic writing was still very primitive. They still had very primitive writing. So the letters that were used to note down the words and parts of the Quran, and ultimately the entire Quran, this was still very incomplete. It was still imperfect. They still didn't have things like vowels, right? And in a group of consonants, you have a choice between two or more readings. So you can have a group of consonants, okay? You can have CK. So let's have a look here. We Let's take, give you an example of what this is, right? You can have CK. There's your word. Is this the word cook? Is it the word check? Is it the word, um, okay, well, that would be, um, okay, well, well, okay, I can't think of another example, but think about it. Which one is it? Wow, thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. I am very grateful. Thank you. That's VV. Um, thank you very much. Right? Much, much appreciated. Thank you, really. So, not cake, because... Actually, yes, it could be cake. You're right. Thank you very much for that. It could be cake. Let's put that in there. Cake. Okay? Coke. Right? So, think about it. These are very different words. You've got this two consonants, no vowels, no dots, no dashes, click. Okay, yes. Actually, no, you'd have CK because you'd have two consonants. Yes, sure is Yahweh. You'd have two consonants. You'd have two consonants there. So what is the word? What What is the word there? Coke is completely different to check, which is totally different to coke. Cake, which is kaka. <laughs> the reason I chose the word was because of kaka. <laughs> Actually, yeah. <laughs> uh, so that's Marshify. Okay, hold on. I'm going to have to bring it up here. So, yeah, let's just bring this up. The reason that I chose the words, the letter CK was, <laughs> was actually because, uh, yeah, okay, was because of Kaka. <laughs> right. um, okay, so, yeah, so that kind of was in my head when I, okay. So, anywho, so understand, when you've got just consonants, right, a choice between two or more readings is possible. You can end up with, with, what does that word mean? I mean, this thing can mean completely different. Bring me a cake is completely different to bake me a cake, which is completely different to uh, I want to have some Coke, which is, understand, it's, it's, yeah, it's not the same thing. Now, if the Quran was perfectly preserved by being memorized perfectly, why are they variants? Why are they variants? Which one is the variant that was sent down to Muhammad? What was the original version given to him? So disagreements arose on exactly how to read the revealed texts. So there wasn't just disagreement as to what is the original text, as how do we pronounce this? How do we read this? What word is that? 
because it's perfectly preserved and perfectly clear. As um, Thunderous was telling us earlier, it's a perfectly clear Quran. So yeah, are you guys, does this all make sense so far? Hopefully I'm bringing something new to this talk. Hopefully I'm bringing something fresh to this particular discussion, but hopefully you're learning something fresh and new here. And does this all make sense? Do you see how confusing this is? And it only gets worse. It does not get better. <clears throat> so, Idris Haris al Kalima says, My sex shahad is this the anointed redeemer is the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father except through him. Much better than Yeshua. Thank you very much. Crystal clear. So, guys, yeah, let me know if this is all making sense. I mean, this is like, what is going on here? And I haven't even gotten to the hadith yet. Look, I did show one, two hadiths, okay? I will do a separate section on hadith. This is like the third or fourth part of this. Um, I've I finished like two or three parts, and I will do it. So I'm working on the hadith section just to look at what the hadith say, because I want to kind of want to separate those out. So let's look at these the standard Islamic narrative in Encyclopedia of Islam, Volume Five. Links in the description. Get a copy. Now most of my reference notes here will come from the Encyclopedia of Islam, which is the gold standard academic reference. I've already found contradictions, and I don't mean like like subtle differences, but actual contradictions between uh, like the 1980 printing that I have of the Encyclopedia of Islam versus the current 20, 20, 2019 printing or something like that. I've already found contradictions in the story. So either the scholars had made a mistake earlier or they made a mistake later or who knows what. But anyway, I've already come across contradictions, right? So the promulgation of a canonical... So anyway, I'm using the Encyclopedia of Islam. It's the, it's the, it's the academic gold standard. Although occasionally I will refer to, to, to sort of common knowledge. I'll refer maybe to Jay Smith. I'll refer to just the common things that are out there, what Muslims commonly say as, as comparison. So the promulgation of a canonical redaction of the Quran under the third Caliph Uthman soon after the year 30 of the Islamic calendar or 650 was intended to remedy the evil of the confusion about the Quran canonization. Copies of this redaction, sorry my typos here, <clears throat> copies of this redaction were sent from Medina to Kufa to Basra and Damascus, the most important cities of Iraq and Syria. After a relatively short period, this redaction was generally accepted as official, finally even at Kufa. So this redaction was eventually accepted at Kufa, eventually, darling. Where Ibn Masud, who died in 33, 653, the distinguished companion of the Prophet, had maintained a particular version of the Quran, a reading, a version of his own, right? And he had at first called upon his followers to resist the new Quran. So an actual companion of Muhammad who had memorized the Quran had told his companions, do not accept this new version it is not the correct version. He eventually relented and accepted the new version and let go of his version. So these other versions had more verses or less verses, a chapter more, a chapter less, because it's all preserved dot for dot, letter for letter from the beginning. Yet a uniform kira'a was not guaranteed. So during recitation, which was essentially based on oral tradition, readings deviating from the official edition continued to be followed. So after the Egyptians dumped the earlier Qurans in the river, new Qurans or the old Qurans still persisted. They're still available. That didn't solve anything. It didn't fix anything. Right. So readings deviating, deviating from the official edition continued to be followed insofar as these readings went back to recognized authorities. So as long as this particular version went back to someone who could claim some sort of credible association with Muhammad and the companions, right? And so they went back to authorities of the early period and to trustworthy witnesses. They were also noted by commentators on the Quran. So they were said, okay, well, you know, we'll, we'll let that go. We'll accept that as authoritative as well. Because even though it's different, it's identical and don't be a bigot. So Thunder says, what about the guy who suggested another way of writing a verse? Muhammad accepted it and said, yes, write that. Yeah, look, I'm not getting into the into the hadith right now. That's that's not getting into that. I don't want to get bogged down in the hadith. I want to get through some of this history first. So, <clears throat> so thus, variant readings of Ibn Masud and Ubay Ibn Kab, okay, uh, who died in 29, 649, or maybe 654, and other early readers which deviated from the official text were transmitted in early scholarly literature, that's Muslim scholarly literature, was already back in the beginning of Islam, at the early years, while the companions were still alive, were already transmitting variant 
Qurans. They were already transmitting different versions of the Quran that were not letter for letter, dot for dot, preserved. And these have come down to today, at least in extracts. So the Ruwaya or the Kira'a of Al-Hassan al-Basri, right, from 728, was later even inserted among the 14 readings. So a much later version from 728 was later inserted among the 14 readings. Oh, what? 14 readings? I thought there's one version. What do you mean 14? Or is it one? Is there, are there 14 versions of the Quran? Or is there one unchanged, perfectly preserved Quran? Okay, so I just got sent a message. Let me see. I found the mammoth of Quran mistakes. Feel free to use it then as an example of covering up and mistranslating passages. Um, <clears throat> okay, hang on. Let me just bring this up now. I may as well just do it now while it's here, while I'm thinking of it. Um, so this is from Yeshua is Yahweh. It says, O people of the book, do not go to extremes regarding your faith. Say nothing about Allah except the truth. The Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, was no more than a messenger of Allah and the fulfillment of his word through Mary and a spirit created by a command from him. So believe in Allah and his messengers and do not say, Trinity, stop for your own good. Allah is only one God. Glory be to him. He is far above having a son. <clears throat> Who is giving glory to Allah? Allah is giving glory to Allah. Right? So, yeah. <clears throat> So, um, is that what you're referring to? Yeah, you're referring, so Allah is referring to give glory to Allah. Allah is saying, hey, you give glory to Allah. Glory be to Him. To Him. Who's Him? He is fog. So, who is saying that? Muslim scholarly sounds, yeah. So, yeah, that, I mean, that's definitely, um, yeah, there's times that Allah is giving glory to Allah, and you're like, but you are Allah. Yeshua is Yahweh, please stop. I'm going to shut down Skype. If you don't mind, it, it's interrupting the flow here. It makes a noise when Skype messages. Notifications pop up. I'm going to quit Skype. Okay. So, are there 14 or 1 perfectly preserved Qurans? Now, there had to be systemization, right? So, the Quran had to be systematized because it was not systematized. It had to be canonized because it was not canonized. It had to, all these variations had to be shrunk down to as few as possible. Not one, just, just for at least 14, maybe 30, maybe 60, maybe 72, maybe 500. Who knows? But... And they also had to limit the possibilities of the readings, which the consonantal text, that's the text without the vowels, right? The consonantal text allowed for multiple misinterpretations of the words, right? So the consonantal text and the oral tradition allowed multiple readings. This is not just a pronunciation issue. This is not just a an accent issue or a regional dialectic issue. Right. <clears throat> so why would they need to systematize a perfectly preserved text? Systemization and limitation of the possibilities of the readings were necessary to ensure uniformity and accuracy in the transmission and recitation of the Quran. So have a look here. Prior to dotting and diacritics, look at these words prior. These are the, this is prior to the Islamic language of Arabic developing and becoming more sophisticated. You go from this to this. You go from this to this. And you go from this to this. You understand that that, yeah. What do you so so diacritical marks, namely fatha, damma, and kasra, and sukur, which had slightly different shapes than is the case today, were introduced. As well, dots above or below certain letters had to be employed to lessen resorting to intuition and context. In other words, making it up as you went, right? In deciphering what similar letters stood for. So people got confused about similar letters, didn't know what it mean, and kind of made up their own readings because well, I think it's cake, the other guy thinks it's cook, and the other guy thinks it's coke. So, yeah, right? That's just how that was. So, there was, because of the language alone, there could not be a matter of certainty. Because of the primitive nature of the writing, there could not be certainty. So, by establishing a standardized text and limiting variations, scholars aimed to preserve the integrity and authenticity of the Quranic message, preventing discrepancies and maintaining consistency across different regions and different communities. All right, <clears throat> so the consonantal text, that's the consonants of the Quran allowed variations because early Arabic script lacked vowel markings and diacritical signs, making it susceptible to different interpretations and pronunciations. Now, here's a question. Arabic is the language that's in paradise with Allah, right? So, didn't Allah send it down in perfect Arabic? 
he sent down a clear Quran in Arabic for the Arabs in Allah's own language that Adam spoke. And yeah, so Arabic apparently developed over many centuries as well. And it didn't, it started off as a primitive language and, but it, Adam spoke Arabic. Exactly. So, so do you see a small problem with the whole Islamic narrative? There's, in fact, there's only problems with the standard Islamic narrative. It's nothing but problems, right? So this led to variations in reading and recitation, which required later scholars to establish standardized rules. Later scholars had to establish standardized rules to ensure consistency and accuracy in the transmission of the Quranic text. So yeah, Adam spoke pure heaven Arabic. Uh, isn't that amazing? And I'm sure Jibril spoke proper Arabic to Muhammad. So yeah, that, isn't that odd that they couldn't write it down in proper heavenly Arabic script? Odd, odd, just don't understand it. Right, so the impact of diacritical marks. The absence of diacritical marks in an early Quranic Arabic can lead to ambiguities in the text because these marks are crucial for determining the correct pronunciation. And if you pronounce it wrong, you could think of a different word, right? You can say two words that are very similar and someone doesn't know which word are you referring to. Like, for instance, to make a joke about my country, where I come from South Africa. It's like there was a very old joke back in the day when someone says, you know, these books, eh, we, we, you know, this is how black people speak with their, because of their accent. Eh, the, all of these books, we must, we must bend them. We need to bend these books. And then guy says, well, did you say you want to burn them or ban them? Then we must bend them. Did you say ban or burn? Ban. Ban them. Ban them. Ban all of them. Burn or ban? B ban them. B ban. Ban. Ban, ban them. They all the other books. B make all the books ban. Ban, ban them. Uh, do we want to ban? You get the picture, right? Uh, you can call me a bigot, but I'm black from Africa, so, so go away. So anyway, so these marks are crucial for determining the pronunciation, grammar, and meaning of words. Here are five examples of how the lack of diacritical marks could result in variant readings and changes in meaning. Yeah, she's aware now, ban their books, Jonathan Silver. Yes, yeah, bo, yeah, bo, yes. So, so okay, let's look at some, let's look at some diacritical marks and how these can lead to variant readings and also changes. Bend them. B <laughs> oh gosh, I have the smartest people in the chat. You know that? Seriously. I've got some of this. Bend them. Bend them. Let's bend the books. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so, yeah. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So the word KTB. Okay. That's an example with the Arabic next to it. Right. Without diacritical marks, this could be read as Kataba. He wrote. Kutiba, it was written, or kitab, book, amongst others. Okay? The impact, this changes the subject and the tense of the action affecting the narrative or legal ruling conveyed. He wrote, it was written, or book. Those differences can make a big difference, right? Now, now you've got, so the word elm, l m Okay, with this little diacritical. Without diacritical marks, this could be read as alima, he knew, ulima, it was known, or ilim, knowledge. Okay, so those are already the kind of differences that you will get without these diacritical marks. And this is the confusion that was creeping into the Quran. Thousands, thousands of these differences was creeping in. <clears throat> Impact, this alters the source or the state of knowledge, impacting theological or philosophical interpretations. Then the word, Jabon, how can you begin to deconstruct this topic without being an Arab scholar? I mean, how can I, you know, how do babies learn to speak? You know, they suck it in through osmosis. In this case, I can read because we have academic volumes. Scholars actually write things. And they know, you know what the crazy thing is? That people are actually supposed to study at university. They're supposed to study academic books. People write books. We can read and we can learn because because unlike Muhammad, we're not illiterate idiots. No one said Adam spoke Arabic. Now, that is, there's a Oh, sorry, Jews. Had a severe attack of, um, of, uh, I'm sorry, Ooh, what happened there? Uh, no one said, remember I said that no one said, uh, let, let's, okay, I'm going to give you half an hour. You can get lost. Um, remember I said that no one said that the Quran was preserved dot for dot, letter for letter. Uh, yes, they do. Everyone says that. That's a complete lie. 
and um, yes, they do say that, that he spoke Arabic. And uh, thank you, Thunderous. So yes, uh, yeah, sorry, Mr. Judge, I didn't want to say that. Yeah, exactly, it's going to confuse things. So the language while written similarly worked a bit different, so it's not completely the same issue. Yeah, so anyway, okay, let's have a look here. Let's look at the word katal. I'm sure if we take some time, we can work through scenarios where this could be critical in terms of law, in terms of clear theo theo theological definitions. You're going to run into contradictions. You're going to run, in run into problems, quandaries, because of the differences of words. I mean, it did happen. It will happen. Or, it's, or it has, you know, it has happened. It will happen. Or it must happen. Which one, right? Um, let's look at the word QTL, katal. Without that critical marks, this can be read as katala, he killed. Kutila, he was killed, or katal, killing. That changes the tense. So this changes the narrative from active to passive, affecting the assignment of moral or legal responsibility. This has a legitimate impact on law, on intent. So this is going to be critical in a court of law. So the impact of diacritical marks, two more examples, four and five. The word SLH, without diacritical marks, could be read as sul, peace or reconciliation. Salaha, he reconciled, and Saliha, righteous. Um, I invited Murad uh, through Mal to come on my channel to talk about his new Quran version, and I'd love to have him on. Uh, I did invite, I did reach out to Mal and told him, guys, come on. Um, but I haven't heard back. So, so yeah. Yeah, grapes or virgins, CMB, exactly. Very good point. Um, that's actually a very, very good point. So, yes, if you guys can reach out to Murad, let them know, please. I don't have Murad's contact details. I'll let Mal know again. I'll remind him. Mal was going on holiday, so he said, I'll get back in a couple of weeks. But, yeah. Grapes or virgins? Yeah, grapes or virgins. Exactly. Is it grapes or is it virgins? Grapes or virgins? Are you going to get, right? Are you going to eat some grapes or are you going to, are you going to get, get jiggy with the, with the women? Uh, it's kind of a, that's a big difference. I'd say that's not a small difference. So without that critical marks, this can be peace or reconciliation or he reconciled or he is righteous, right? <clears throat> now, so impact it affects the context of social or personal conduct that is prescribed or described so that leads to confusion the word jhd we all know what that is without diacritical marks it can be read as jihada he strove jude effort or jihad struggle so muslims are happy to try to forget that it means jihad and because it's not really struggle because that's also a lie jihad is a legal term it is a legally defined word. It means to it means warfare against Jews and Christians to establish and impose Islam. That is warfare, violence to establish and impose Islam against the Jews and the Christians. So yeah, don't believe everything that you read, okay? There's there's a bit more going on. That is a legal term. So you can have colloquial definitions, but it is a legal term with a specific legal definition in the Sharia. Impact. This alters the nature and context of the effort or struggle being referred to with significant theological, legal, social, historical implications. It is kumpf. Canal. Okay. Um, because, let's go back here. Because jihad. Oopsie. Jihad. So Adolf, you know that guy. Right, wrote a book called Mein Kampf. Right, you can may as well translate it as Mein. There you go, same thing. Think and repent. Thank you very much. I'm really grateful. Thank you. Um, thank you for that. Yeah, much appreciated. Thank you. So, Mein Kampf, Mein Jihad. That's exactly what that is. My struggle, because Hitler had a struggle on his hands, right? He just struggled to take over the world and kill everybody. Yeah, that, that's kind of the struggle he was on about. It was just a yeah, effort. It wasn't just an effort. It was murder. Right. So these examples show how the introduction of diacritical marks was essential for clarifying the text of the Quran, ensuring precise transmission of its message. And we now know this was a major problem. So the early Arabic scripts' lack of these marks meant that the context, the oral tradition, and the scholarly interpretation played a major role in understanding and preserving the Quran's meaning, except they still don't know what the original Quran was. They still can't tell you if you held a gun to their head. They are completely and utterly unable to tell you which original Quran was sent to Muhammad, what were the words, as stated, as written, that were given to Mo and written down, which version was that. Muslims today, no matter who, absolutely, positively cannot tell you. 
the whole story is a lie. And that's this is part one, probably doing three, maybe four parts on this. So guys, I think I'll end here. I think I've gone for an hour and a half. And uh, hopefully you are, yeah, hopefully you've, you've learned something from this. Hopefully learning that the, that the standard Quranic narrative is a complete farce. <clears throat> Muslims have no leg to stand on. They have no way. So hopefully I've provided something fresh to this narrative, so a broader, fresh set of facts and history, especially that George Sale thing was very interesting from the 1730s. So we need to go back to all the history and have a look at what were these Quran people finding. Um, I've got in my archive, my Google archive, uh, links in the description. I've got old Qurans. I've got one from the 1600s in there. I've got one from the 1700s in there. Some of them do not have verse numbers. It's crap. Exactly. It's complete crap. The Quran, right? So you can get some older versions of the Quran. You can look through those. You can examine those and see. And uh, there's like an old French translation that, that was taken from. There's some Persian translations. So yeah, so that you can look and see it's not the same as the one today. So yeah, which one is the right one? Well, we'll as in part two, we'll have we'll start to have a look at. They just they didn't use old Qurans because there was no old Qurans that they could use to determine what was the original Quran. They don't have an Uthmanic text, so why didn't they go to the oldest Quran in the top copy museum or in Yemen or something and go, okay, well let's just copy that one and here you go, here's your new 1924 Quran. They didn't do that. They completely ignored older Quran versions. They totally ignored older Quran versions. That's it's so weird. Why would you do that if you had them? Because they don't have them. And they used the Hafs version. And then now they switched to the Warsh version. It's like, okay. So, <clears throat> so yeah, guys, Idris Haris al Kalima says the Quran wasn't even given to Muhammad. It was written about Muhammad. I mean, Mo, Mo doesn't really appear in it. I mean, Mo is mentioned, what, four times? Maybe twice directly, twice indirectly. And then Jesus is mentioned like 80 times. Right? Jesus is alluded to like 80 times and Mo, maybe four if you stretch it. And two of those might be to Jesus as well. So it's kind of weird. Okay. So guys, thanks. That's it for me. Hopefully you've learned something. I will be on uh, tomorrow night. I get home late, so I cannot stream. But Sunday, I'll be on with Dustin Quick again. And um, uh, Thunderous, I'm disappointed. You know, should have been on time, man. We could have had a great stream, a great conversation. But um, yeah, I had to. So yeah, he never returns. Thank you, Lloyd. You barbecued the Quran. Now it's time to barbecue some chicken. Great stuff. What about the Quran Murad uses? <clears throat> I'll get a copy from him as soon as it's ready. Um, uh, as I said, I don't have direct contact with him. I, every now and again, we have the occasional contact. But um, but yeah, I mean, I'll definitely get a copy. I've, I've been I've been sending him donations as well. And I suggest you guys, you know, might do as well. It's, um, you know, send him a dollar or two, right? So uh, he's doing some great work. So I'm looking forward to the full version. I got the sample, but uh, I'm looking forward to the full version. So yeah, Muhammad was, was originally a messianic title. So yeah, so uh, George uh, Gerigli Oskola, so it was good work. I Thunderous, I said, check my channel for the time. I said, I've got a time that's set on the channel. I had a broadcast time set on the channel and then I even moved it half an hour and I tried to get hold of you. So yeah, anyway, that, that let's, that's not a public discussion. So, okay guys. So um, John 844, what, what does that say? May the, may the thunder of God strike you down and burn you to a crisp because you deserve it, you infidel. Okay, sorry, man. Apologize. But but because I wanted I wanted Thunderous to bring the thunder because you know he brings the thunder, right? So um, I bring the sarcasm. He brings the thunder. So next time. So Thunderous will we'll, we'll redo this. <laughs> Opinions 10 verse 7. <laughs> Night, guys. You take care.